This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howey, and this is Season 10 of Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers brought to you by the Fur Bearers. We spend our lives with dogs, sharing joy, sorrow, companionship, and often surprisingly deep friendships. But sometimes we can be perplexed by our best friend's behaviors or make assumptions about why they're barking, rolling over, or refusing to let you have the ball after demanding that you throw it for them in the first place. For those who want to learn more about dogs in a practical, direct way, Dr. Mark Beckoff has a solution. His new book, Dogs Demystified, an A to Z guide to all things canine. The new book, which has a foreword by Jane Goodall, is an encyclopedia of dog behaviors, technical and colloquial terminology, and pretty much anything you need to know to learn to be a better companion to your dog and understand their needs. Dr. Beckoff, Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado and an ethologist, joins Defender Radio to share what led to this new book, why having citations on his website makes for an easier read, and how demystifying dogs can lead to a happier, healthier companion. I absolutely loved reading through this new book of yours. Oh, thank and you. It, I, I always enjoy them, but this one is organized and presented in a much different way than I think almost anything you've done before. Um, yes. It, it's almost like a, a glossary or an appendix that should arrive with every dog into someone's home, I think. Yeah, the idea just came to me just to, you know, have it grounded in science and readable by anybody. And, you know, honestly, people really like it. They can go to a particular topic if they're having trouble with barking or they want to know about playing or recognition or peeing or humping or mounting <laughs> or you know some people have read it straight through um so thank you yeah it was it was a labor of love and when the due date came it couldn't have come sooner <laughs> <laughs> um but but yeah no thank you it's been really fun and then the singer Joan Baez did all the original drawings which to me was wonderful Oh yeah, I I absolutely love those drawings. Um, yeah. They remind me of my my colleague uh, Marcy. Her mother does a lot of watercolor work, and it reminds me of her style. Uh -huh. uh, she's she's done a lot of our pets and stuff as gifts, and oh. it's a very accessible way of drawing that shows someone's emotional intent in the drawing as well as the emotional intent of the drawing. I think, in a very yeah. classic kind of cartoon or almost newspaper cartoon way. Yeah, she actually, um, Joan has a new book out called Am I Pretty When I Fly? And she does all her drawings upside down. Really? Yeah. And that, that would be another interview. But when I've asked her, you know, can you say more? Um, there's not much more to say, honestly. She does them upside down. And mm -hmm. and some of them, I mean, you know, the, I mean, one or two in my book were intricate, but some in her new book are really intricate. And I'm thinking... Man, I couldn't draw them right side up. No, I <laughs> know what the hell they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, that was you know that was an added um, bonus. Sure. Well, I think it's it's a great actual segue of talking about how the artist drew things upside down, and that perspective creates perhaps a different view of it, because in a lot of ways, that's what this book is about: is helping people challenge their perspectives or not even challenge them just maybe ask questions and understand things from a different perspective mm -hmm. um, I, and that's i've always enjoyed about your writing and, and the writing you've done with jessica pierce in the past as well is that's a common theme of curiosity yeah wow well thank you for the compliment and you're you're right i mean i mean i did the book for a number of reasons I mean, and, and they're not necessarily in order of importance, but, you know, before people get a dog, they need to realize what a huge responsibility it is. You know, yep. time, energy, money, frustration. Um, it's like having a kid. Um, the second is I would like them to be dog literate. You're fluent in dog. Mm -hmm. And I realized right-minded people get dogs for all the right reasons, but they don't realize how much there is to know. So I really wanted to make it accessible because 
I've actually had some emails. Somebody said, I got a dog. I was expecting, you know, something else. And she didn't, wasn't calling the dog a thing. She just didn't know what to expect. And, you know, the dog was up one night whimpering. So I looked up whimpering and, you know, and, and went through the whole um, sort of, she didn't quite go through the whole alphabet, but it's a good way to become dog literate. And it's also a good way to put forth the message that dogs are fully sentient beings and that we're responsible for them. You know, they say from cradle to grave, from the day you get them to the day they have to leave. And I wanted people to have fun reading it too. So I've got some yeah. great stories in there. Um, and some I've added some humor, maybe a little off color humor, but <laughs> what what the hell? I mean, you know, um, but but people are enjoying it and and um and I'm pleased. I it was it was a hard book to write. And I and not that books are necessarily easy, but I wanted to dispel myths like mm -hmm. Dogs are not unconditional lovers. You, we have yes. to earn their love. Uh, dogs are not our best friends. Dog abuse around the world is is high. Dogs aren't like Zen beings who live in the present, you know. And you know the myths that sell books, but really give a false impression of who dogs are, and that really eats away at the dog human relationship because then people develop expectations. Now, oh, dogs are unconditional lovers. My dog doesn't seem to love me. What's wrong with the dog? And I'm going, well, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the dog. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you other than you believe the junk that dogs will love you no matter what you do. Yeah. Well, and I think that's that is what is so compelling about it, too, is it's, as I said, it in the gentlest possible way forces someone to consider their perception from a different mm -hmm. angle. So you spend a lot of time uh, uh, through the introduction and at various points in the book, rather than telling, almost asking the question of, if you put yourself at the height of a dog, if you consider that your smell is different, mm -hmm. how is that going to engage you? Um, you know, don't think about the dog as a person, think about the dog as a dog. And how would a dog experience something like this? And I recall many, many years ago, hearing and i think it might have been from you that dogs experience joy and happiness and fear and anger but that doesn't mean they experience it the same way we do right you you probably did hear it from me i mean you know dogs and other non-humans have very rich and deep emotional lives so some people will say well they don't love like we do, so therefore they don't love. You know, they don't think like we do, so therefore they don't think. And no, no, no. I mean, I always say there's dog joy, chimpanzee joy, human joy. Mm -hmm. And even and, and there's individual differences. So my joy, my grief may not be the same as yours, but it doesn't mean I have it and you don't or vice versa. And, yeah. I, and that's a real I'm glad you raised that, Mike, because that's a really important message in the book, because people will say, oh, I had a dog of of this breed or this mix, um, we lost them, we had to give them up, we had to put them to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. So we got a dog of the same mix of breed and they're radically different. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and so that's, you know, that's another major message of the book is that dogs are individuals, there's no universal dog and breeds don't have personalities, individual dogs do. And mm -hmm. You know, every now and again, somebody will give me grief for that. So the point I'm trying to make, because I'm also, you know, an evolutionary biologist, is that evolution establishes what we call predispositions to do something or um, limitations. So, yeah, border collies are radically different from dachshunds and beagles. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that there's it's like a Venn diagram that they can't overlap, you know, in yeah. the circles of personalities and temperament. So that's another big message is that if you had, a, you know, people clone dogs and I've heard of people who clone dogs and the new clone may look like their old dog, but, it, but he, she doesn't behave like them. Yeah, of course. Um, and it really, and that, you know, sorry. Yeah. I was gonna say, that it just, it, to me, that seems very obvious. Like if you cloned me, would my 40 years of experience and interactions and memories and, and synaptic connections be cloned with that? I wouldn't think so. No. Um, right. Unless we're talking sci-fi. So why would people expect a dog to somehow behave the same way? 
Yeah, I think what they're cloning for a lot, without even knowing it, but I've heard somebody tell me this, is they're cloning for the aesthetics, the look, you yeah. know, and assuming that with the look, all the genes that the, that are responsible for temperament, personality, et cetera, um, are going to follow along too. But that's, I mean, that's just bad biology. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and people, you know, people I know tend to raise a dog if they get a puppy, even of the same mix or a breed, or if they rescue dogs that who are, you know, very similar over the course of a few years, they raise them differently just because they have more experience. It's like first time versus, you know, multi-time um, human parents. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, but that is, you know, that's, among the other messages is that there's no universal dog. Um, people don't, most people don't realize that of the billion or so dogs on the planet, only about 25% are homed dogs. The rest mm -hmm. are free ranging or feral. So once again, the vast majority of studies that have been done to date to today are done on home dogs and laboratories, a limited number. And it's not that the science is bad. It's just people may be asking the same or similar questions of different dogs in different settings by different researchers, given different rewards, et cetera, et cetera. So people are uh, surprised when they go, well, we looked at a couple of studies that were, su that were studying the same you know, phenomenon but they came up with different results. What's the story? And I'll say, well, there's the best example that you could do good science, but because of the methods and the dogs and the way the research is done, you're going to come up with different results. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so that's another big message is, yeah, the studies can be good, but we need much more uh, research on free ranging and feral dogs. And there's a lot more going on today. It's, it's something Jessica Pierce and I wrote about in, a book, A Dog's World, Imagining yeah. the Lives of Dogs in a World Without Humans. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, it's it's so simple, but for some people, it's really complex. <laughs> that makes sense. And I, I got to say, uh, for me, it feels like, and, and there's several times this has occurred to me, uh, moving from journalist into advocacy work, it feels like in my memory, a switch got thrown just something all of a sudden made sense in a different or new way. And everything I have learned since then has been in a different or unusual way. So reading about um, dog agency, uh, especially in your book, uh, again, with, with Dr. Pierce was um, Unleashing Your Dog, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a wonderful book that, again, I think everyone who wants to have a dog or enjoys <laughs> dogs should read. Because it was one of the first times I really challenged myself on how I was perceiving things from my dog at the time and how much depth that gave our relationship over the years. I actually just lost her about two months ago yeah, after I'm 11 years to together. That. Thank yeah. you. Um, but it, it really deepened our relationship for many, many years in a wonderful way because I was able to start questioning my perception of what I thought she was doing or thinking or feeling. And when you start doing that, all of a sudden, the whole world seems a little bit different. Um, and, oh. and I think it's just, it's fascinating that you are able to sort of help people get to that without relying on heavy science. Like you, you cite the science always, and there's often science uh, involved or it's based on science, but you don't need a biology degree to understand it. Right. And yeah, every, I mean, yeah, it's, Yes, yes, yes. Excuse me, I, I agree. I mean, one of the main questions like in philosophy stems from a classic paper by a philosopher named Thomas Nagel, who asked, what is it like to be a bat? And although people had been looking at questions like that before, it really framed it to say, OK, what's the sensory motor life of a bat? How, what are their senses like? What are they capable of doing, you know, motorically moving? I mean, they fly. We don't fly. You know, they can have, you know, ultrasound. We don't have ultrasound. But you're right. And that's another message. It stemmed from unleashing your dog, that dogs need to exercise their bodies and their senses. So, yes. you know, a big message is the dog's walk is for the dog. Yep. You know, they'll tell you what they want. And if they're sniffing or, or looking around or cocking their head to locate a sound, 
the worst thing you could do is say there's nothing there. It's not that they <coughs> understand the insult. <laughs> it's more there's a lot there that we don't pick up. So yeah. it's getting into their their umwelt, we call it, their 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 world. And once again, you're right. I mean, it really is a change in perspective to think that their noses are so much more sensitive than ours. I always hesitate to say a hundred or a thousand times because we really, we really can't put a number on it. But they're much more sensitive. They have twenty eighty vision, not twenty twenty vision. Mm -hmm. You know, they can hear a lot that we can't hear, and their ears can move around, even floppy ears. So you're right. And so one of the ways to become or getting back to the message from the beginning to become dog literate or fluent in dog is to understand how they quote see smell or hear the world yeah and and that most of the input they get is it's multi-sensory um ethologists call them composite signals so they're cashing out sounds odors and tastes per and visual cues at the same time and they're sorting and it's you know the dog's nose has a very complicated structure and they can actually s snort out odors they don't want yeah um, and and i wish i could a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not pretty when i do it um but 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 you're right and and the minute you take or try to take their perspective as much as we can it really opens the door for appreciating them for who they are as as dogs as you know member canady members of the dog family as carnivores um they all come from a common wolf ancestor and they still have wolf genes in them and they've got memory engrams we call them in their brains from the times they were wolves thousands of years ago and and i really have had a lot of people thank me for Thank me for cashing it out in a way they can understand it, and I and I don't mean like dog, you know, dog behavior for dummies. Although it's kind of like that when, <laughs> when dumb, dummies is not pejorative, but dumbing it down, but not losing the science, you know, and not not losing what we know, yeah, you know, and I, and and you know, you know, you know from reading my stuff is I always say the more I know, the more I say I don't know, and people. People, I once got a really obnoxious email from an engineer who asked me a question, and I said, I don't know. And he said, well, you're the expert. And I said, yeah, I feel like I'm a dog expert, and that's what makes me say or admit that I don't know something. Yeah. And we got into this very long discussion. It was really fruitful. Dogs are individuals. Without my seeing his dog in the situation in which he was interested, upfront and personal not videos i mean mm -hmm. in in local if you want well i can't make a comment about why the dog is doing something yeah um and and more and more people like it i love i call you know them citizen scientists they send me stories the book is loaded with stories and yes since you've seen them they're packed with important information you mm -hmm. know they're, they're packed with information that could lead to many theses and many research projects. So when some of my colleagues say, yes, yeah, somebody wrote me about something and I told them dogs don't do that or can't do it. I'm thinking, well, maybe lab dogs or home dogs don't do it. But I see it every day at the local dog park. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, when you, you, you make the note of uh, you find it, I think, frustrating when people try and say that dogs do or don't do something because it's it's almost, I suppose, inherently limiting uh, of curiosity and of understanding or compassion. If we decide something's not possible, yep. <laughs> regardless of whether or not we have evidence of it, it just ends a conversation. It ends a line of thinking or questioning. And that is almost anti-scientific in its nature. Right. And and in, sometimes, you know, people will say, well, you're, you know, so you worship science. No. And, and you know that I don't worship science, but but I like to have things grounded. In fact, even uncertainty. So if I say I'm uncertain about something, at least I can say, look, you know, there's been a lot of studies of why dogs hump or why they pee or why they sniff. And there's no one answer. 
Yeah. You know, so it's not like I worship science. It's just it's a good foundation. And, you know, there's topics in there like ESP and mirror image recognition, mm -hmm. um, theory of mind, whether dogs understand what another dog is thinking and feeling. And, yeah, I feel they do. And some people will say, well, someone so studied this. And they said they don't. And I said, well, I'm seeing behavior that's indicative of this every single day among free ranging feral and, do you know, free running dogs at dog parks. So it just opens the door for the possibilities. But you're right. I mean, dogs don't fly and neither do humans. I'll accept that as a fact. <laughs> um, you know, yes. dogs don't drive except in cartoons. But other than that, you know, when you're looking at their cognitive, emotional and moral lives, there's a lot they do. And there's enough evidence out there from some data and from some stories to me to suggest that they're doing something that some people don't think they can. And we need to study it further. But having said that, I think there's things we're not going to access very easily until we develop the methods to do so. And neuroimaging is one, you know, yeah. of the methods that's being used. It's non in the what the studies I know are non invasive. And we're learning things about how dogs brains fire like ours do in certain situations. Same, same, same parts of the brain fire when dogs are in situations where you would suggest they're jealous, as when humans can tell you they're jealous. So yeah, that's, that's pretty important information. It's incredible. And then you consider too, just how different human brains can function in similar circumstances. So talking about the, the um, neuro mapping and stuff, and I, I imagine with some functional MRI or other tools, we can sit two people together and have them go through the same experience of watching a video or something and the parts of their brain that will activate will be different based on their personal experience. So if one person has a trauma related to what they're seeing on the television screen, uh, it could activate uh, the fight or flight or freeze section of their brain. Someone else mm -hmm. just sees something they think is funny and they laugh yep. and experience joy. Yep. Uh, so if we recognize that within people, wouldn't it be a reasonable expectation to see that in other mammals? A absolutely. And what you just said is so important because sometimes somebody will say something that they mean as a joke and I usually understand it, but sometimes I'll go, well, you know, that's not really funny. And they'll go, well, I'm only joking. And yeah. they're clarifying it so we can misinterpret visual. I mean, maybe olfactory, but certainly visual signals and auditory signals, the tone of a voice, the pitch and things like that. So you're right. And there's there's no reason <laughs> you just said it perfectly. There's no reason why two, I quote, identical dogs who have different experiences won't interpret this exact same stimulus, if you will, differently. Yeah. You know, one of them associates a particular sound or a particular odor with a friendly human. Another associates it with a human who used to beat them. They're going yeah. to respond. Uh, they're going to respond very differently. Well, and I think an interesting uh, play on that was uh, racist dogs as a subject in mm -hmm. the book. Um, and I just thought I, I've had this conversation with so many people who say, oh, my dog barks at these people or, or reacts in this situation. And they automatically say, so the dog is reacting to something that we perceive as racism. Um, but you, you approach that in a very unique way. Um, which I, I appreciate of saying the signal of what we're perceiving can travel down the leash at times. <laughs> and I thought, isn't that interesting? And I remembered having a fearful dog many, many, many years ago yes. and being taught by someone, you see how you tighten the leash when you see something that you think might upset them. They're learning that that thing you are seeing is potentially bad and your fear is being transferred to them. And I, at the time, it blew my mind. And this reminds me of that. Yeah. Um, when I lived in St. Louis, I had a big Malamute and I would walk him a lot. And sometimes I just have him by my side. And I met up with this guy who, in all honesty, I, I'm not sure of his eth ethnicity, but not fully Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And so I was walking down the street 
uh, Moses, the dog was on a long lead and he, I'd see him every morning. He was a friendly guy. We chat sometimes we'd each have a cup of coffee in our hand. This was way before Starbucks and yeah. he, and he would cross the street and I, one day we were chatting and I said, you know, my dog doesn't bite. And the guy said, well, how does he eat? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it, it, it blew my mind. And we had a long talk and it turned out that he had had a very bad interaction with a large dog some years before. Mm -hmm. And he liked dogs, but he was afraid of big dogs like my Malamute. So was, so was my mom. She had been bitten when she was young, and it didn't. It it wasn't that she hated dogs. She was just scared of them. Yeah, you know. And so, yeah. I, I mean, you're right. And and I think that you know, there's all these studies that show how well dogs can sniff us. They can sniff moods. They can tell us when we're angry and we don't know we are. They can sniff out diseases mm -hmm. and can look at different faces and, and detect anger and can smell our fear. And so when you when you make a kind of smoothie of all of that, what you have is a dog who is reading what we're feeling. And I'm not saying a dog is saying, oh, Mark and Mike is angry. They're happy. They're sad, but they're picking up the context. And you're so right about it traveling down the leash. And all of a sudden, my dog Moses might be saying, "Well, Mark, Mark's in a, Mark's having negative emotions. I don't know how he would cash it out. Yeah. And maybe I should, or yeah. because you know Mark's not feeling well. Maybe I should. I don't know what's really going on in the dog's brain, but you're I, you're exactly right." And I've had people tell me that when they, when people tell them that a dog is afraid of certain people who look a certain way, they wear hats, they wear gloves, they wear masks, especially during COVID. Yep. The, the dog responds like the person does, and I'm going, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course they do. I mean, when I would lived in the mountains, and it only happened a few times when I would have think someone was around my house in the pitch black pitch dark and I'd get up and I'd run through the door, you know, really fast, my dogs would be very alarmed. Or on the other hand, if I knew someone was coming over and I strolled to the dog, they would approach door, they would approach the door as if, oh, Mark's meeting a friend. Yeah, for <laughs> so, sure. So yeah, it travels down the leash and it also travels in the air from, you know, what they hear, what they see and what they smell. But the tension on a leash it's it's not been studied very much is a to me a cue that we, we we really need to know more about because you see people dragging their dog away from something yes you know or you see the dog dragging them towards something or away from something and we need to honor that yeah absolutely that was um a, a very meaningful moment again in my relationship with jj was letting her decide the walks after I, I went through unleashing your dog and you and I talked about it uh, for mm -hmm. the show. And the way our relationship changed after that was so wonderful because she understood she got to choose. And there were times I would disagree maybe, right? So if she wanted to go across the street when there were cars, nope, we have to wait. But otherwise, yep, we're going that way. And at that point too she also learned very clearly how to say no in a way she never had before because she mm -hmm. understood that i understood i think what she wanted and then was able to showcase the opposite so resist what i wanted by you know it settling into her space and pushing against me and then as soon as i started respecting her saying no so going outside or going a certain way on a walk she and i could all of a sudden communicate yes and no almost yeah, you're you're hitting on two words that are appearing more and more in both not only scientific or philosophical, but popular literature. The two words are agency and consent. And, you know, we wrote a lot about that in Unleashing Your Dog. Agency really means granting somebody, another individual, dog, cat, person, the freedom to make choices and have more control over their lives and consent. You know, and I always say, does your dog agree with what you are asking of them, what you mm -hmm. want them to do? And there's no doubt in my mind when you cash out some some research that's been done, but it just from thousands of hours of watching dogs, 
the more agency and more consent a dog has or a cat, it's actually been studied a lot in cats, the happier and more content they are and the better your relationship with them is. They're saying, oh, Mike and Mark gives me the freedom to sniff, gives me the freedom to be the animal I am. Yeah, maybe when I go hump and dog and a person's leg or their leg, they don't want me to do it. But, but in all seriousness, we allow them to do what we call dog appropriate behaviors, sniffing mm -hmm. and doing, you know, I call it groining. They'll sometimes put their nose right into oh, yeah. your groin. And I understand why people don't like that. It doesn't particularly bother me. But when they feel that they have agency and they feel that Mike or Mark is saying, do you agree with me? And if you don't, let's reach a happy compromise. Relationships are compromises. They're two-way streets. Um, they're, they need to be based on negotiation. And yeah. when, you, when you constantly helicopter a dog or you control the dog, it, it's like with a person. They, they don't feel safe. They feel uneasy in your presence. And they're not going to do what you want them to do all the time. Or just one little slip will make you really unhappy. And I actually studied this at a, a dog park where 85% of the time people were telling their dogs, don't do something, stop, do, stop doing something, or we don't do that. And the dog is like, we? <laughs> <I'm a dog. laughs> um, yeah. And only 5% of the rest of the time did people actually, in a, say, in a way, spontaneously say, good dog. And I would do that. And people would say, well, why are you saying good dog? They didn't do anything. And I said, well, that's exactly why I'm saying it. They're a dog. They're just hanging out. They're being, quote, a good dog. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful concept, too, uh, of simplifying our expectations at times, I think, too. And when I consider a lot of the reasons dogs are rehomed or returned or, or, or killed far too young and unnecessarily, it's frequently because a dog is expressing a behavior, which is normally a want or a need being expressed, that they don't like and don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. And you'll have some people who will say, oh, we'll use this training method and it'll fix it 100% of the time or use this training method and it'll fix it 100% mm -hmm. of the time. Whereas if we compare that to, uh, for example, and I know the parents out there love it when I do this, compare it to a toddler or a younger child. We don't say, oh, the only reason this behavior is happening is this one cause. Yeah. We look at the spectrum of things that could be happening, the constellation mm -hmm. of variables and yep. start balancing which ones are, are is the person overwhelmed by something and then acting this way to deal with that feeling or need or is the person angry and therefore lashing out in this way that doesn't seem angry based but that's what it's rooted in like we ask those questions but with dogs and many other non-human animals we simply don't it seems yeah and and that relates to another message in the book of the importance of taking into account what we call context mm -hmm. who's involved what are they doing where is it happening what what kind of day is the dog having are they having yeah. a good day a bad hair day have did they have nightmares but in all seriousness context is another word that you can add to agency and consent and that is yeah. I mean, I had my dogs were generally happy. I lived in the mountains. Their friends would come down. They never they rarely had collars or leashes on. Mm -hmm. Every now and again, it was clear something was bugging them. Maybe they had a stomach ache. Maybe they were having chest pains. Maybe they had a bad dream mm -hmm. and taking into account context. And that's another thing I, I say to people at dog parks. This one guy wondered why his dog would never come to him when he was sitting at a table. And then it dawned on him that when he was home, he had trained his dog not to sit at the dining room table because he didn't want him begging. Yeah. He asked me what I thought. And I said, well, if it were my dog, he could sit at the table and I would teach him not to beg. But yeah. the dog was avoiding the table. And the guy was saying, but he's free here and all that. And I said, no, he's he's not free. You're sitting at a table. At home, you're sitting at a table and you've trained him. And I know the dog, the guy didn't beat him, but, you know, he basically asked him to avoid that situation. Yeah. And from an ethological point of view, because I'm an ethologist, context is critical because it'll change what dogs and other animals are doing, even in 
even when the differences between two uh, two situations are really subtle. I mean, it could be an odor we don't detect. It could be a sound that they hear and we don't. Or it can be something we see, but they don't see because they don't have as good a vision as we do. Yeah. Um, so context is critical. And, you know, some people go, oh, this is just too damn complex. And I usually say to them, well, you've got a sentient being living with you. Give, give them a break. And really, most of those people come back and go, wow, you know, I've been thinking about agency and consent and context. And, you know, my dog seems happier. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm nice because I'm a pretty nice guy. I'll say mm -hmm. your dog is happier. Your dog is more content because you're giving them the opportunity to be a dog and to express their dogness. Yeah. And this applies, of course, to cats and other companion animals. I mean, it could apply to all animals and applies to humans. The more the freer you feel to express yourself, the more safe you can feel and more, you know, you, you don't feel that somebody's helicoptering you and every five seconds is going to do. Don't do that or stop. But we don't do that. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. you're hitting major points, man. This is <laughs> I'm <crazy>. glad. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I think well, that's it's, it's even the redirection at the park. I remember going to dog parks uh, in the past and rather than saying don't do that, it's hey, come play with this instead. Right. So just those little subtle shifts one can make of and I, I think that's actually something I read in a parenting book of all places. Rather than say no, redirect to something more appropriate. So you're not just creating these negative associations over and over and over. You're showing the preferred behavior and reinforcing it. Yep. And, and you know, redirected behavior is is a classical concept in ethology that's used in different ways. But you're right. I mean, you know, I had um, one of my dogs would like to tug at pant legs and I didn't really care. But, you know, I didn't want him to trip me. So if some of them were there and, they, he, they, you know, he was tugging at a sock or a pant leg or the bottom of a skirt or shorts, I would just give him a rag and he'd take the rag. He'd head shake it like he was killing something and he'd be the happiest dog in the world. So yeah. he he, you know, and if I was with people who I knew didn't like that or it was dangerous that they might trip, I would always just have something in my hand and wave it in front of him and he would take it and he'd be a happy go lucky dog. So you're right. You're not telling them, no, don't do that. You're telling them that by allowing them to express the behavior and another behavior I write about in the book that's really important to dogs is chewing. Yes. And the reason dogs chew um, is that um, it's part of their innate repertoire. Mm -hmm. If you will, Paul McGreevy, who is a vet and an ethologist in Australia, last summer was in Boulder and we were talking about that. And we he's very interested in chewing when you I mean, I did I've done field work on a lot of different animals like coyotes, wolves. They spend a lot of time chewing. They like to chew. It may feel good on their gums. Who knows what it cleans their teeth? Who knows why they're doing it? Dogs like to do it, too. They're carnivores. Mm -hmm. So another lesson I've learned is asking people to say, well, I know you don't want your dog to chew your favorite socks or shoes. I don't really want that to happen. Make sure they have things to chew on. Yep. <laughs> and, and people would say, wow, my dog stopped chewing my favorite socks or shoes or underwear. And I'll go, exactly, because really, they're not trying to piss you off. They're just saying, I need to chew. Yeah. And I actually learned that I knew about it, but Paul and I had dinner. And at the end of the dinner, it was really in my brain that chewing is a need for most dogs. So let them chew, let them sniff, let them look around and see what's happening. Let them locate a sound and don't tell them there's no reason to chew or there's nothing there because in the, the bubble in their brain is, oh, my God, I wish you were a dog. Oh, well, maybe I don't wish you were a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I've got two things uh, to yeah. wrap up on. One of them, okay. you you talk about, um, well, one thing you're doing in this book that I, I personally love is you're talking about the notes section online on your website. So for oh, any yes. potential readers, rather than have a massive citation and footnote at the bottom yeah. of every single page, it's you can read this study or you can find this link yeah. in the notes section. It's just, it's one of those, why haven't we been doing that for the last 20 years with books uh, concepts? Well, thank you for that because it was a pain in the butt. But 
But, but, uh, no, I've had emails from people saying, thank you. They're reading the book. They go to my homepage. They can copy and paste. They can't, the links aren't live just because it was impossible to do without costing another couple of thousand dollars, mm. but no big deal. But I've had emails from somebody saying, hey, we were reading the entry on self-recognition or tools. We went to your website. It's all alphabetical. We copied and pasted the link or the title, in, and there was the article. And I'm thinking, my God, I wish that I, I could. I, I wish I could have done that with the massive number of books and papers no I read. But it's becoming more popular. And in all honesty, one reason is it would have added 130 pages to the book. It would have yep. driven the price of the book up. And a lot of people, and I, I actually talked to somebody at GoDaddy and other people who work on the web, there's really only a small percentage. I mean, it, it, it could be a large number if it's a lot of readers of who really go to every reference. So oh, yeah. this, one, this one email from a guy, I don't know him, really pleased me. He said, thanks for doing it. I love. He said, I love your book, but what I really love is that I have your homepage opened. I'm reading an entry on rolling or smiling or playing. I go to it in the bibliography, and if I want to see a popular or a scientific paper, I copy and paste it into my web, you know, into a browser. And there it is. Thank you for saying that. It's becoming it's becoming the trend in a lot of books, and I think it's really good. Yeah, it's 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 also frankly just more accessible because I don't have a subscription to a university library, but I can go to your website and follow a link. So in terms of actually following up on citations or sources, it's just more accessible that way too. Well, it it also means you don't have to hand write out a link or a title from a bibliography in a yes. book. Yes. I mean, seriously. And, you know, people can write me. I haven't gotten any yet and say, well, that link's expired and I can go in and update it. I mean, I yep. I actually think it's the wave of the future. And what it really did and my editors were really um, important in, you know, helping us, well, helping me. But we all made the decision is it's updatable and it's readable. It's not mm -hmm. like Beckoff or Howie 1983 found this and then you have to. Go to the end of the book to find it. So you're flipping back and forth. Mm -hmm. You can just have something open or you can check it and go back later. So yeah. it, it's going to be, if you will, forever there on my website. So thank awesome. you. I'm, I'm going to tell my editor that because the feedback I've been getting from people is really positive. So thanks yeah. a lot awesome. for saying that. Yeah. Um, and talking about the science, you, you wrote and you've already mentioned how there is a, almost an impossible amount of knowledge to one day have. And as much as we already know, there is more we don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that really piqued my interest for two reasons. One, because I recently saw another little uh, meme type thing on uh, the lack of our knowledge about our depths of our oceans. Uh, and someone just did a really good job of showing the scale of how mm -hmm. little of the ocean we understand or have visited. Um, but it then also made me think, if this is true of our, quote, best friend who evolved alongside us, who is responsible <laughs> for billion dollar industries, what does yep. that say about the wildlife around us? What does that say about our ecosystems we're living in? Yeah. Um, how little do we know? And does that mean we need to maybe stop thinking of ourselves in this era of information and start looking at it maybe as an era of curiosity? Yeah, I I love that. And you're you're absolutely right. It when people I love when people who are experts in their field say, well, here's what we think is going on, emphasizing the word think mm -hmm. and say, but we really don't know. And I've been working with a guy who just wrote a great book on cats. And the last paragraph of his book, I just read it this weekend, really rung true. I mean, this guy knows cats. Like I know dogs and he's an yeah. outstanding, distinguished evolutionary biologist. And the last paragraph of his book basically says, well, we know a lot and there's a lot we don't know. And I hope you realize that. <laughs> but yeah. It's like it's OK because because future grad students or, or professors, researchers have to have something to study. <laughs> and when people go, well, we know all that, I'll go. If it's a, if it's about dogs or carnivores, I usually can think of a question about which we know nothing. So I'm not yeah. trying to be a pain in their butt. I'm more saying, well, you see, we don't know everything. Yeah. And that's exciting. 
it's exciting to know that there is so much potential ahead. And I think in the face of the word crisis appearing on my headline feed every day, 10 times, (laughs) it's also where we can find hope, right? It's what we don't know is ahead of us. I couldn't agree more. I mean, when people tell me that they, and I don't mean it in a pejorative way, but, you know, people starting out their graduate degrees or even, you know, advanced undergrads say, I can't think of something to study. I'm really interested in wolves or coyotes, carnivores, something I know well, or play behavior or marking. I'll go, oh, um, when you have an hour, let me know, and I'll list questions for an hour. Um, yeah. But but what it does is, and it's not done in an insulting way, it's like excites them. They'll go, oh, God, you're right. We don't know that. Or, oh, my goodness, you're right. This study looked at X, Y, or Z, but it didn't do A, B, or C. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things in the book. I, in a lot of the entries, I'm just flat out honest to say, hey, this is what we know. This is what we don't know. And there's a whole lot of studies waiting to be done. And I'm hoping, you know, ho- hoping people will pick it up pick up on it yeah well it's certainly inspiring citizen science and i gotta think there's a lot of grad students and future grad students and past grad students out there who can contribute where they're at to uh individuals professors and writers like yourself who challenge that notion of what we do and don't know yeah Um, no i but uh, yeah i appreciate that thank you yeah uh, to wrap up, though, you asked a wonderful question in the book of many experts uh, and dog lovers of what would you ask your dog if you could speak dog? And <laughs> I want to flip that a little bit. What would you want to say to dogs if you could speak dog? If if this was a podcast for dogs as opposed to people who enjoy dogs, what do you want them to know about all of us on the other side? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, for me personally, it would be... Um... I hope you understand I'm doing the best I can. And I really want you to have a good and a safe life. And please let me know if I'm not honoring your, you know, membership in the dog or the the dog family. Yeah. You know, um, um, that's what I would really want to know that even though I do know a lot about dogs, there's things I don't know, or or I would like to learn more about how, th- how yeah, your typical dog does this, but I'm not your typical dog for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. You know, like this whole idiosyncratic behavior and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and also, um, you know, just honoring that, once again, dogs are all individuals, and they, they don't all like the same thing, and they don't all dislike the same thing, and they don't all develop into the same mold, if you will. To learn more about Dr. Mark Beckoff or find Dogs Demystified, visit markbeckoff.com or visit your local bookstore or library. Links are available in the show notes. I want to thank Mark for sharing his time with me once more and kicking off another season of Defender Radio. And thank you for listening and sharing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for the Fur Bears and Defender Radio reminding you to stay informed and stay strong.